Again, I would like to thank those of you that are tuning in, uh, those that have tuned in on uh, multiple occasions, have enjoyed uh, the messages. Uh, we are located in Wilton, New Hampshire, Good News Bible Church on 27 Hutchinson Road, and we meet at 10 a.m. on Sundays, and we would love to have you come visit. If you do not have a church home, uh, please come and visit us and be blessed. Thank you. Henry Morris says, the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is the crowning proof of Christianity. If the resurrection did not take place, then Christianity is a false religion. If it did take place, then Christ is God and the Christian faith is absolute truth. In 1887, Henry Drummond preached a sermon in Northfield, Massachusetts entitled, Dealing with Doubt. And he says, Christ never failed to distinguish between doubt and unbelief. Doubt is can't believe. Unbelief is won't believe. Doubt is honest. Unbelief is obstinate. Doubt is looking for light. Unbelief is content with darkness. Loving darkness rather than light, that is what Christ attacked. And he attacked it unsparingly. But for the intellectual questioning of Thomas, Philip, and Nicodemus, and the many others who came to him to have their great problems solved, he was respectful and generous and tolerant. But how did he meet their doubts? The church, as I have said, says brand him. Christ said, teach him. When Thomas came to him, denied his very resurrection, and stood before him waiting for the scathing words and lashing from his unbelief, they never came. They never came. Christ gave him facts. Facts. Jesus gave the disciples, including a very obstinate Thomas, proof, factual evidence of his resurrection. And they all were never the same. We have some of their historical written proof of the resurrection of Jesus. Yet there are always those who doubt the validity of the manuscripts or testimonies of the disciples. But look at what Jesus says about New Testament believers. In John 20, 29 through 31, then Jesus told them, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And Jesus did many other miracle, uh, many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So then, what does it mean to be blessed even though we did not witness the physical resurrection, nor have we seen our risen Lord? Well, number one on your outline, because of the resurrection of Christ, every disciple of Jesus has been gifted with living hope living hope. In Peter's first epistle, he says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Being gifted with a living hope means that you've been given a new birth. The words begotten us again in the Greek means to cause to be born again, in the sense of to be born again spiritually. It refers to a radical change in one's personality with the attendant change in the state or to change the mind of one thoroughly so that he lives a new life and one that is conformed to the will of God. Why is this new birth so important? And why is it so different from what worshipers of God experienced before the resurrection of Christ. In Old Testament times, God set up a sacrificial offering system so that people could experience forgiveness of sins. The writer of Hebrews in chapter 9, verse 22 says, in fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. The book of Leviticus 
gives us explicit details as to the sacrificial system that God set up that blood would be spilled and sins would be forgiven. In Leviticus 23, 26 and 27, the Lord said to Moses, the 10th day of the seventh month is the day of atonement. Hold a sacred assembly and deny yourselves and present an offering made to the Lord by fire. Do no work on that day because it is the day of atonement. When atonement is made for you before the Lord your God. Atonement, kapur, to atone by offering a substitute. You see, the day of atonement, it was the 10th day of the seventh month, Tishri. This solemn day was the only day of fasting prescribed for Israel. It was celebrated by a special sin offering for the whole nation. And on that day, only would the high priest enter within the inner veil bearing the blood of a sin offering. This day was the only fast required of the people. This day was so important that the people were to do no work, no eating, and meditate on what was about to happen. For many individuals, this was a day of deep reflection. Once a year, the Day of Atonement was observed. It was the only day of the year in which the high priest could pull back the veil that separated the holy place from the holy of holies, the most holy place, and enter the room in which the Ark of the Covenant rested. With a ceremony cleansing and with the sacrifices of bulls and rams and two goats, atonement was made. Again, from the book of Leviticus, chapter 16, verse 5, from the Israelite community, he is to take two male goats for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. I want you to remember the fact that there were two goats consecrated unto the Lord. Lots would be cast to see which of the two would be sacrificed. Aaron, the high priest at that time, would then bring the goat chosen for sacrifice and he would sacrifice it to the Lord. He would then sacrifice a bull for his own sins and that of his household. He would take a censer bowl full of burning coals from the altar along with incense and take them behind that curtain. The smoke from the incense would conceal the atonement cover or mercy seat so that the high priest would not die in the presence of the Lord. He would then take the blood of the bull with his finger and sprinkle it on the front of the atonement cover. And then he would sprinkle it seven times before the atonement cover. After that, he would sacrifice the goat for the sin offering for the people and take its blood behind the curtain and do with it as he did with the bull's blood. No one was to come near the tabernacle, which is also known as the tent of meeting, while this was happening. I want you to imagine what was going through the minds of the people while this was happening? What would you be thinking about? Many people were awestruck as they realized the complete holiness of God. Many would be thinking of their sins. Many would be in tears at the sight of the innocent life of animals being slaughtered in their place. Many would be agonizing with the fact that their sin was constant, always with them. And many would struggle and, and, and feel the shame and guilt of their sin. And I wonder how many would be screaming within themselves at their lack of power to be pure and holy, constantly struggling with lust and greed, jealousy, lying, covetry, hatred, slander, deceit, and so on. Letter A on our outline says the law was a constant reminder of condemnation. The tabernacle was a constant reminder of conviction. And the sacrifices were a constant reminder of transgressions. The law was a constant reminder of condemnation. The tabernacle was a constant reminder of conviction. And the sacrifices were a constant reminder of of transgressions, of sin. So the high priest would come out of the Holy of Holies and then out of the holy place and out to the place and announce that the people had been forgiven. Think of this. They experienced forgiveness, mercy, 
grace. But as they looked inwardly, they were reminded of their constant battle with their sinful nature. But then enter the second part of the ceremony of the Day of Atonement. Aaron the high priest would, would then take the live goat and lay his hands upon its head and confess all the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites, all their sin, and symbolically put them on the goat's head. And with a person designated for the task, they would take the goat away into the desert. But there is a more significant meaning for what took place here. A visual reminder for the people. Look at what the scripture states. So Leviticus 16.10. But the goat chosen by Lot as the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to be used for making atonement by sending it into the desert as a scapegoat. In verse 22 of chapter 16, the goat will carry on itself all their sins to a solitary place and the man shall release it in the desert. Letter B on your outline, the goat was symbolic for the removal and sending away of sins. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Psalm 103, 11 and 12. But even with this symbolic reminder, people would still go on sinning. Guilt and shame and the battle with the sinful nature still haunted the people. And every year, the same sacrifices had to be made. Why? Because the blood of sacrificial animals could never completely remove and cleanse a person from their sin. Hebrews 10, 11 says, Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. This is why we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, because it is the new covenant. And because of it, we are gifted with a living hope. The author of Hebrews says in chapter 9, 11, and 12, when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made. That is to say, not part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood having obtained eternal redemption once and for all by his own blood. This means when Jesus died, he entered into the most holy place, the greater tabernacle that is beyond our complete understanding. It's in another realm. Just as Aaron entered the Holy of Holies and then came out to announce the people were forgiven, Christ came out of the grave. He rose again to announce a new covenant in his blood, one in which there is complete removal of sins for yesterday, today, and forever. Again, Hebrews 9, 13, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean, sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. The two goats constitute one offering. The slain one typifying Jesus, the vicarious bearing of our sins penalty, which is death. The scapegoat is the removal of our sin out of sight to where no one witnesses, where no witness will rise in judgment against us. Listen to this. The goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto a land not inhabited, and he shall let the goat, let go the goat in the wilderness. Not inhabited means it was so called because the area was cut off from water or from habitation. You see, let us see on your outline. In the uninhabited place was no witness to bring forth any accusations. 
Again, the writer of Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. How much more, how much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. Let's expound on this. Number two on your outline, living hope fills the heart of a disciple of Jesus with assurance. You see, being gifted with a living hope means not only that you have been given a new birth, a new spiritual birth, but you've been also given a new heart and a new mind. The author of, of Hebrews chapter 10, 12 through 17 says, but when the this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. And because by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. And then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. One of the greatest, most powerful, most liberating truths of possessing living hope is this, letter A. Because of the resurrection of Jesus, your sin is completely and utterly paid for and forgiven, never to be remembered. That is the greatest news man could ever receive. But then the writer of Hebrew, he, he says, and then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. You see, letter B on your outline, there is no condemnation for those gifted with a living hope, for those that are possessed by Christ, for those that have placed their faith in the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ and believed that he was raised from the dead. In Romans 8, 1 and 2, it says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Jesus Christ, the law of the Spirit of life set me free. It set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemns sin in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the spirit. Romans 10, 11 says, as the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Peter says, but we are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that we may declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. There is no love without hope, no hope without love, and neither hope nor love without faith. And this leads us to number three, living hope fills the heart with confident expectancy. Not only are, are we filled with assurance that we've been forgiven, but we have this heart, this living hope within our heart that gives us a confident expectancy. What do I mean by that? Again, Hebrews 11.1, 1, now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. The Nelson's Illustrated Bible Dictionary says, in the Bible, the word hope stands for both the act of hoping and the thing hoped for. Hope does not arise from the individual's desires or wishes, but from God, who is himself the believer's hope. Genuine hope is not wishful thinking, but a firm assurance about the things that are unseen and still in the future. Larry Carter, president of Great Lakes Christian College, tells the following story. He says, I remember when I was a kid some 40 years ago, playing on a little league baseball team. 
One of the things our coach did was host a picnic for the team at the beginning of the season. After we ate hot dogs and burgers, he sat us down for a pep talk. And he asked, how many of you have a dream to one day play in the major leagues? Almost every hand shot up. Every kid with his hand up believed he could do it. You could see it in their eyes. He then told us, if that is to happen, that dream begins now. I was so inspired by that challenge, all of us were, that we practiced and played so hard. We went undefeated for the next few years. All-star teams from other leagues would play us and lose. Some 25 years later, I became a little league coach. And I brought all the kids together at the beginning of the season to give them a pep talk. The same one my coach had given me. And I asked my team the same question. How many of you have a dream to one day play in the major leagues? Not one hand was raised. Not one kid believed he could do it. You could see it in their eyes. I was speechless. The rest of my talk was meaningless. So I said, really, nobody? Well, go get your gloves and let's throw. I thought about that day for a long time. What had happened in the 25 years since I was a kid? What had come into their lives to steal their dreams? What had convinced them they would never be more than what they were? Those poor kids had no hope. They were believing the lie that they would be underachievers. In the spiritual sense, when a person has no living hope, they do the same thing as these little leaguers did. They just settle. They take no risks. They go through the motions. If they even dare to do that and believe they are less than what God says of them. You see, when disciples experienced living hope, which is, in essence, comes from the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit, the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead, they did the impossible. They pierced the darkness. They took on demons and wickedness and lit a fire in the hearts of those who received and believed their message, which, by the way, was Christ crucified and risen again. Acts 2.36 says, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. It's been said, hope prevents us from clinging to what we have and frees us to move away from the safe place and enter unknown and fearful territory. Therefore, through possessing a confident expectancy, we can give a are all in this life for God's glory because we have hope that we can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens us. This living hope we possess helps us to do what we think may be impossible. Remember, we are not settlers. We are pioneers who in Jesus' name can carve out new paths of spiritual purpose, leaving a spiritual legacy for others to be strengthened by. And this brings us to our last point. Living hope brings about the anticipation of the great reward. Jesus said in Revelation 22:12a, "Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me." Paul in his first letter to the church at Corinth said this, "But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep." For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Hope. When you possess a living hope, you plan for the future. Because you are anticipating the joy of reaching your destination. Therefore, as the bride of Christ, possessing a living hope brings about joy as you are anticipating the arrival of the groom, the marriage supper of the Lamb, and eternal life. 
I bought my wife a hope chest when we got engaged. And in that beautiful wooden hope chest, she placed things, things for the marriage ceremony, things for our future apartment. And it was based on the hope of that day in which we would exchange vows and begin a life together, a hope chest. When you possess a living hope, you plan for the future, you live for it, you anticipate it, and you live differently. Hebrews 9, 27 and 28 says, and as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many to those who eagerly wait for him. He will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Thomas Aquinas says, God destines us for an end beyond the grasp of reason. Nathaniel Hawthorne says, our creator would never have made such loving days, lovely days, and have given us the deep hearts to enjoy them above and beyond all thought unless we were meant to be immortal. John recorded these words that Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled. You trust in God, trust also in me. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. Our hope is because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, conquering the grave, conquering the devil, conquering death, and giving us a living hope. So the author of Hebrews says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. And number five, living hope promotes purification. It promotes that word that we spoke about last week, sanctification, the process of being made holy. 1 John 3, 1 through 3, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God? What is that love? That love was expressed through Jesus' death on a cross and a stone rolled away so that we could peer into an empty tomb. How great is the love the Father's lavished on us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire. The elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promises, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. That's what a living hope does. It transforms you. It changes you. And how is that done? 
through the very person of the Holy Spirit, the same power that raised Christ from the dead. Lastly, 2 Thessalonians, may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. He has risen.